Welcome to episode 16 of the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. My name is Chris Time Steele, and this month I had the opportunity to speak to the scholar and author, Dr. Yasmin Saidullah. Yasmin is co-author of the book Radical Dharma, Talking Race, Love, and Liberation with Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams and Lama Rod Owens. Yasmin was recently out in Colorado where she was part of a Buddhist retreat. In this episode, we talked about her research on Harriet Jacobs, Buddhism, abolishing whiteness, a hip-hop guerrilla theater project she was a part of in the Bay Area, queerness, and why we need more fugitives. Special thanks to Awareness for the Music. If you can support the show, please do so on Patreon. And here's a short jingle from another Channel Zero Network podcast member. Kite Line is a weekly 30-minute radio program focusing on issues in the prison system. You'll hear news along with stories from prisoners and former prisoners as well as their loved ones. You'll learn what prison is, how it functions, and how it impacts all of us. Behind the prison walls, a message is called a kite. Whispered words, a note passed hand to hand, a request submitted to the guards for medical care. Illicit or not, sending a kite means trusting that other people will bear it farther along until it reaches its destination. Here on Kite Line, we hope to share these words across the prison walls. You can hear us on the Channel Zero Network and find out more at kitelineradio.noblogs.org. So, uh, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing okay. I'd like to begin by talking about a woman you've done a great deal of scholarship on, and that's Harriet Jacobs. She was born in 1813. She was enslaved in North Carolina. She escaped from enslavement in 1842 and went on to speak out and fight for abolition. Can you talk about your research on Jacobs and why her thought is needed more than ever right now? Mm, Thanks so much for that question. I love talking about Harriet Jacobs and thinking with her writings and letters. So I uh, started out looking for information about abolition. I was studying uh, prison abolition and uh, was working at different spots in that work and began to see how difficult it was to have theory and practice match up in the in the activist world in general, but in particular with abolition, the abolition of prisons, imagining a world without policing and caging and surveillance and our reliance on them to keep us safe. And so what I ran into was all of these different ways that we are constantly running into ourselves, like, oh, we don't want to um, actually rely on the police, but we're policing each other in our organizations, right? We don't actually want to use surveillance, but we're actually um, vetting and surveilling people before they come into the organization. And so I was interested in figuring out if there was some kind of authentic abolitionism that we missed um, in our in our effort to fight incarceration. And so I started going back to slavery and slave abolition, anti-slavery abolitionist movements, and reading different uh, works and accounts and histories and theories about that and found Jacobs as I was beginning to um, read Sadia Hartman. So Sadia Hartman's Teens of Subjection references ex- extensively Harriet Jacobs' work and life and theorizes her um, political status as a woman, a mother, and an enslaved person. And so I went to that text and I read it and I haven't been able to put it down since. Her work has been instrumental in helping me understand the ways that abolition is not just kind of an intentional mass movement, but an everyday practice, and actually a way of looking at the world, a way of inhabiting captivity, so that there is actually more space, more room for possibility, even within spaces of constraint. So the way that she finds freedom begins with her escape into this tiny garret space, a seven by nine by three foot attic crawl space that her uncle carves into the roof of a tool shed on her grandmother's property. And her grandmother has um, worked to buy her own freedom through what she calls midnight baking. Mm -hmm. She bakes cookies in the evening. And after she's done with her labors, 
And with the cookies, she then she sells the cookies to the white women of the town, and they're their favorite cookies. And with the money, she is able to buy her own freedom and that of her son. It's her son who then builds a trap door into the roof of this tool shed, and that's the space that Harriet Jacobs hides in for seven years while she's keeping herself safe from the pursuits of her master who wants her to be his concubine. And she's had a couple of kids by another man. And so it's also her way to stay in close proximity to those two children and make sure that their freedom is being worked towards while she's in this hiding space. And so, in fact, instead of leaving the plantation altogether, it's by staying in it, but in a different way that allows her the vantage point, literal perspective, and proximity to be able to make other possibilities manifest Mm -hmm. in that space of incredible constraint. And so that's the kind of core of, of of the narrative that I work with. She calls it the loophole of retreat. And so I think a lot about the ways that we are constrained into loops and then how do we find the loopholes within our cycles of constraint and exploit them in ways that actually make other things possible. Thank you for that summary. And you had referred to this this uh, place where she was was hiding, but also searching for liberation as her no space. Uh huh. Because it's it's uh, kind of connected to this co- concept of utopia that is not just another place, but a non place. And sometimes, in order to be able to move towards something like freedom. Stephanie Camp is a black women historian who talks about, she wrote a book called Closer to Freedom, and everything about black women's mobility was the thing that was most closely monitored and surveyed. Um, Simone Brown also does incredible work on helping us understand how the surveillance culture of post-9-11 U.S. has its history in the slave context, in the time of slavery, like just and, say something, say something. Exactly, exactly. And so runaway slaves, white people were incentivized to um, not aid and abet uh, runaways and not to stow them in their houses. Um, in fact, they were facing criminal penalty. I, I forget exactly what the penalties were, but they faced penalty if they were found to be in collusion, um, conspiring to help people steal themselves away. And so that no place um, is a really powerful concept. In in the book itself, in the Incidents of the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs, she writes, there is no place that could have concealed me. Um, There's no place in in slavery's, well, gosh, what does she say? I want to just look it up and read it because it's so perfect. (laughs) The the phrasing of it. You can look it up if you want. In her language, but Essentially, she says, there's no place that I could go that would have afforded such uh, protection as that hiding space. And I take that to understand that even she's writing this at this time uh, from the north, um, actually not far from where I am right now in the Hudson Valley. So she's writing it from a place of so-called freedom, and she still writes, there is no place that could have afforded me <laughs> afforded me such protection. And I take that to mean that in this period of time, before the end of slavery, there was nowhere that she could have been where she would not be within slavery's grasp. So by occupying no place, as opposed to taking refuge in the North, she's actually able to create a different relationship to both freedom and slavery from that vantage point that allows her the possibility to recover herself. I think by virtue of the context that she was born into, Um, the specific context that she was born into, she was born into the possibility of being human because she had a relationship with her mother and father, didn't know she was a slave until she was six. And so there was something of herself that got taken away once she realized she was a slave and once she was sold to a man who was trying to make her his concubine from the time she was 13, maybe even earlier. And so in that no place, she's actually able to come back into relationship with herself as a subject not subjected to uh, his will, but 
free to will of her own accord, which is an incredible thing to, for me to think about in this current moment. Um, there are so many conscriptions of culture, of politics, of law that are bearing down on our sense of who we are, what freedom is, and what we should want for ourselves and for our families, and the ability to have a space to unhook ourselves from those things is precisely what I find in meditation. So the connection for me uh, between Radical Dharma and Harriet Jacobs is really in that no place, a loophole of retreat. Thank you for that. And yeah, when you're talking about Jacobs being in the North still reminds me of the, the Malcolm X quote that in, unless you're in Canada, uh, everything to South. That's right. I do remember reading that. And <laughs> yeah. It resonates uh, still. And um, you, in this note space you, in Utopia, you also talked about the imagined futures. And this, um, I believe in a talk you spoke about the phenomenology of self-defense. Uh, okay, you tied all these things together. So to move on to the, the book that you co-authored, Radical Dharma, Talking Race, Love, and Liberation, this was co-authored with Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams and Lama Rod Owens. I was wondering if you could break open for some listeners, like what are some foundational beliefs that you adhere to with Buddhist practice? Sit and stay. <laughs> Sit and stay. I think that's uh, one of the most important things I've learned in the company of my uh, teacher's guide, Reverend Angel, who is co-author. The first time I met her uh, was at a Black Health Expo in Oakland, and she was speaking about some things that made that resonated with me, but also were seemed too good to be true. And kind of the area around her was kind of like reverberating <laughs> in this way. <laughs> And so at the end of her talk, I raised my hand and I said, okay, but what if, you know, you sit and what arises when you sit isn't comfortable and doesn't feel good or makes you, makes you cry? She's like, just keep sitting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was not satisfied with that answer, but it is so <laughs> clear to me that that is true, <laughs> that, <laughs> that so much of our uh, lives are spent avoiding discomfort. And so when on the cushion discomfort arises, it's one of the kind of great gifts of the practice to just sit and stay with it for a second, <laughs> see what happens yeah. when you don't turn away, when you don't cringe and try to resolve it or make sense of it, but just sit with it. Um, and I think that was one of the most challenging things for me is that there was grief that was coming up that didn't have a story attached to it, that didn't have a name. Um, sometimes it did, but after sitting for a while, it really didn't have a name and it clearly wasn't mine. Like there wasn't uh, something that happened to me personally that was causing this grief to surface. It was just there. It's just part of my inheritance. And I think it's that kind of grief that we really struggle to find space for in our culture, in our day-to-day -day lives today. Yeah, and, and with our, our culture being so individualistic or even just uh, activist or revolutionary culture, it's always, you know, go, go, go. Like, if you're not doing something, you're... That's right. Yeah, you, you're a liberal or something like that, you know, and <laughs> it's, it's so important to to just sit and, and reflect, like you said, and that can actually be more beneficial for your internal battles that you may have. Yeah, because that way you actually know what you're working with. You know what's in here instead of, you know, I'm a preacher's kid, and there is a lot of emphasis on not directly, you know, imposed on me, but I think just kind of part of the culture of the thing is that keeping up appearances became really important to me individually and appearing as if I, I belonged to this family of the cloth. And that really, you know, shifted for me when I started to realize I left myself behind and actually don't know what's in here. I just spend a lot of time making sure you 
are okay with what I'm presenting to you without understanding uh, what I'm carrying and Mm -hmm. all of that unprocessed experience and life and felt sense and knowledge is incredibly important for (laughs) for helping you navigate the world. And so people can end up feeling really lost. Um, and feel like they don't have direction. But what's happening, in fact, is that they don't understand what they have. And we're devaluing what we have in order to um, fit into what we think we need to be in order to belong to whatever community that we're trying to find space in. Well, this, this next question ties in. It's on the chapter, The Abolition of Whiteness. And you explained how you were surrounded by whiteness and internalized it. And you wrote, quote, Dharma practice called my attention to the deepest of my investments in white supremacy and made me feel, without sugarcoats, without apology or redemption, how deeply destructive it is to live in the afterlife of slavery as the embodied and constant reminder of the unexamined trauma of the white experience. Uh, Unquote. Can, Can you break this open more and speak on these experiences and how Dharma practice helped break this spectacle for you? Absolutely. So I was fortunate enough to uh, be inducted into an elite, predominantly white institution of education uh, at age 12. Before that, I was in public schools and around mostly people of color. Most of my teachers were white, with few exceptions, but the culture at least was diverse. And my friends were black and brown and some were white, mostly suburban. I was in Cincinnati and Tulsa, Oklahoma. But then once I got to New York and uh, my father got this incredibly prestigious job that sent his kids to private school, I was in this school that was predominantly not just white, but incredibly wealthy. Um, it's called St. Anne's. It's in Brooklyn. It's an incredible space, uh, very artistic and free, free form education, uh, which is very good for me. And the problem was that there wasn't enough of a conversation happening in that space about race. And because there was a kind of a gap for me between the school I was in before and the school I was entering in terms of you know, where they were in their educational trajectory, I had a lot of catching up to do. And so assimilation and um, blending in belonging had both a kind of intellectual academic valence, but then it also had this cultural valence. I ran smack into kids who were not at all anti-racist and mm-hmm. were saying all kinds of you know, disparaging things to me about my skin color, my hair, and Mm. it was uh, a bit of a jolt at 12. Um, There's also other things happening in terms of gender and sexuality, and it's all very awkward. But it became very clear to me that the way to uh, survive this was to diminish myself as a racialized person as much as possible. And I didn't realize I was doing that because I was young, but I also didn't realize I was doing it because I come from a family where everyone talks this way <laughs> and the culture of blackness has a is not traditional in a lot of ways. Um, we kind of have a lot of black nerdiness in our family. And so I was already out of step with black culture as I had encountered it. And so I didn't realize I was leaving something behind, if that makes sense, Yeah. um, by assimilating. And so by the time I got to Brown University, I had a lot of confidence. I knew how to manage myself and how to maintain my relationship to people in predominantly white, wealthy spaces. There wasn't much that phased me. I was a really kind of almost kind of cocky, self-assured person. People said, I remember someone saying, oh, you're um, intimidating. And I thought that was incredibly funny because I was like, I'm like the kid from the sticks. How how can I be intimidating? But by that time, I'd been in New York for several years and probably 
like take it on that kind of New Yorker personality. <laughs> um, I say all of this to say that I I did not realize that I was along with all of this confidence soaking up a kind of um, proximity to whiteness that was really toxic. And that that confidence was a lot of bravado, and the bravado was plastic and elitist and um, really damaging to myself because I didn't actually believe in myself. <laughs> I believed in the facade. And so once I got to uh, the cushion, I think what was really coming up for me in that moment where I realized uh, I was filled with all of this self-hate and self-loathing was that I drunk my own Kool-Aid and I believed my own bullshit. And even though I had been kind of, uh, you know, faking it till I make it <laughs> in this school in order to catch up, in order to blend in, um, I'd actually drank the Kool-Aid of this elitism and kind of colorblindness in ways that were really damaging to my psyche and spirit. I ended up feeling, as I was walking away from that experience and processing it, like I'd lost my best friend. And so I think some of the kind of tyranny, the tyranny of being right, that if you couldn't figure it out and be right, then um, you would like fail in this miserable way, was part of my upbringing, even though St. Anne's was very avant-garde in their grading system, they didn't have letter grades. I still got that if you don't get it right, you will fail. And that failure means you're disposable. And then as I was in college, I think I started to notice that the way that I was received actually didn't have to do with me. It had to do with white people's lack of really dropping into how racism is impacting them, how anti-black racism impacts them. So I was noticing that I was bringing up things for people that, again, had nothing to do with me, but had more to do with what I represented. Guilt, shame, all of those kinds of things. And I couldn't help them with that, <laughs> but I tried. <laughs> I tried because, you know, people please their personality. And I think this whole process uh, was happening kind of under the surface of relationships, of educational trajectories. I started off, you know, translating ancient Greek. I was in philosophy. I was the only black person, only woman in most of my classes. And that was unnerving, but familiar to me. And being in close proximity to these kind of uh, elite areas of knowledge production, kind of classic scholarship was a comfort to me in some ways. There was a moment uh, when I was in the cafe translating Greek in high school and uh, Kevin Powell walked in and I don't know if you remember Kevin oh, Powell, yeah. but Kevin Powell was one of, on the first MTV um, reality TV shows. Yeah. And he wrote a memoir too, right? Probably his. He's become, we yeah. have yeah, quite prolific and incredible. And I, I've seen him since and I've told him this story and he laughed at himself, <laughs> but he saw me translating ancient Greek and was scowling and looking at me all sideways <laughs> and was like, why are you learning the masters? Da, 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 da. <laughs> and, and I sat for a moment and then the words of uh, the songs that I had been listening to came to my head and I said, I have to know my enemy. And I think there, so I think there was both a, you know, fascination with the classics but also uh, some, something in me knew that I was trying to inhabit them to undo them. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think, I think that that's, that's really what that line means is that I, it took a long time for me to notice how much of the Kool-Aid I had imbibed and that it was actually prohibiting me from being able to be in integrity with myself and that what I was doing in that failure to integrate and to be accountable to myself was becoming a prop for other people's unprocessed anti-black racism. Uh, thank you for sharing that that story and all those experiences. My my next question may tie into the music you just mentioned. 
I was wondering if you could talk about the hip hop guerrilla theater project that you were part of. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so in San Francisco, I just moved there and I was in a place, newly found place of <laughs> wanting to be in black community, being community with other people of color um, and Rage Against the Machine, which was the name of the band I was talking about. Um, and I was really into theater. I was a big theater dork in high school and, and in college. And so I got to San Francisco, took out the Yellow Pages, which was still a thing at the time, and just looked up all of the black theaters in the area and ended up working for this uh, artist director who was running um, something called Afro Solo out of the African American Cultural Center in um San Francisco. And he was wanting to pull together the spoken word artists of the Bay Area, this was about 2002, in order to create a forum for folks talking about how AIDS and HIV are impacting our community um, through poetry. And so it was an incredible way to meet Black folks in the Bay. I just met all of these incredible artists right away. And one of them was this group, Colored Ink, that had been working out of the Bravo Theater in the Mission District, and I was sitting in the audience just taking notes, you know, and being my scholarly <laughs> academic self, and they were short somebody. Someone wasn't there, and they are like, hey, do you spit poetry? And I was like, mm. <laughs> I write really esoteric poems that I then read from a paper. And they are like, no, 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 but you write, though. And I was like, yes. And <laughs> they were like, all right, get up, on here. Get up here on stage. And after that, that was it. I was part of their traveling group, and we they called me the, the, the scholar because I had that kind of air about me already. And But I just became part of the group, and it was an incredible switch for me from being someone who is often criticized for not being black enough by other black folks to be uh -huh. just taken in automatically. And that's something I've noticed on the West Coast. Performances of racial identity aren't as tightly police there yeah. because there's so many different manifestations of blackness on the West Coast. And so we worked um, together in collectives and went to rallies. We went to um, protests, marches, and did our did our thing in public. Um, and then eventually came up with, uh, we got some grant money and, and created a full production in first. I had I had never heard about that, that project. Um, I'm actually a hip hop artist, and when I was out in the Bay Area around that time, we were doing shows with Kirby Dominant and the Psychokinetics. Oh wow! I don't know if you had ever worked with them or heard of them out there? No, everyone we uh, we worked with this artist named Ross Ross Kitty, um, who is a local native rapper. In the Ohlone tradition, and it was all folks who were way under the radar. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of a lot of folks just um, in the community there in Oakland and the East Bay. That's so cool. I'm really glad that you talked about that because I've never heard these stories. Really cool. My my next question was about kind of the the importance of self-liberation while also seeking to dismantle institutions of white supremacy and patriarchy. And one thing I've noticed about Buddhism or Eastern thought is that it breaks apart dichotomies and it breaks apart binaries, kind of something that reminds me of what Franz Fanon said, that colonialism compartmentalizes us. That's and, right. and one thing about Eastern thought or Buddhism is that it really breaks through these binaries and how that how that has been helpful to your scholarship or your self-liberation or vice versa? There are so many things about Buddhist philosophy that resonate for me, um, that brought me in even as a little kid. And I, I find the most clarity in the Heart Sutra, which is one of the prayers that we recite in the services, like the evening prayer and in the morning prayer. And it's just a negation of all the things. It helps me notice that if I get fixated on 
one thing as the thing, I will lose myself in that devotion. Whereas uh, kind of coming back to praxis or the way or embodiment is more about how as opposed to what. And it's the what that getting attached to the what that gets us stagnated into binaries, either or, here, there, self, other, us, them. And by inhabiting that space of the how do I relate to this thing as opposed to just wanting the thing, then we can start to understand that there is a lot more going on than binary relationality. And it gets far more complex in ways that I, been full of Western philosophy, can even contain. I think the ability to contain contradiction is something that Western philosophy really struggles with, even though it's our lived experience of the world. We are contradiction. I can be happy and sad at the same time, right? I can be um, constantly in flux and negating the thing that came before, but not actually letting it go, right? So I can be what I was and what I'm becoming (laughs) simultaneously, and it's not uh, invalidating of anything that I've ever been or will ever be. And I think this kind of container of thought that can hold contradiction is exactly what we need in order to understand how to heal, from trauma, how to heal from racial injustice and gender injustice. And I'm always quoting Reverend Angel, who says everything that's true, that's really true is paradox. And I think that really breaks open things like truth and reconciliation, right? Okay, so the truth and reconciliation process was generative in all of these ways, right? And it fell short of what we needed it to be in all of these other ways. Does that mean then that it has failed? Does that mean then that we ought not try to have truth and reconciliation after mass trauma? No. <laughs> it just means that these things are and are not simultaneously. And that in and of itself is not sufficient to not try to enact them. So I'm particularly when it comes to social movements, one of the things that I found in political science is that if a political movement isn't quote unquote successful, it's failed. And that's actually not the case. The kind of relationships, meaning making, connections, apertures that come out of the dynamism of social movements, regardless of whether or not they quote unquote succeed, are incredibly generative and change lives um, and save lives. And so I think it's really limiting for us to go about the world thinking about things in binary ways, not the least of which is the fact that we eliminate entire groups of people who are non-binary themselves and uh, cannot then hold space for, for them in our lives and in our institutions. Yeah, and I think it does really place to dialectics and and also what you were saying about uh, social movements like Occupy Wall Street is one for sure that right. people saw as a failure, but it put That's into right. a class consciousness. It in, in Denver here, it connected a lot of groups that we still work together. Uh-huh. It's called secondary communication and sociology, and it, it does it does coalition building. I also think a lot of the, like, consciousness around rape culture emerged out of the failures of those encampments to protect folks and, Mm -hmm. like, all of that. So it's it's the good and the bad and the ugly um, come out of those those moments. Yeah, you're you're totally correct because patriarchy was being called out and they said it was a leaderless movement, but then men were taking control and... And yeah, rape culture was being proliferated and all these things were being called in question and indigenous rights. That's right. The word occupy and you have a lot of white college students showing up at these and that's right. Derogatory. So you're generating so many questions for me. So going to 
the non-binary is what we were you were talking about is when I first went to the tribe Buddhist Sangha in Denver I noticed that it had a large LGBTQIA population and one of the senseis at the Sangha is queer and she said she was drawn to Buddhism after being alienated by Christianity and her family was trying to put her into conversion uh, classes, you know, those horrible fictionist things. Can, can you speak about queer dharma? And you had spoke about this in the, in the book. Absolutely. And, you know, Lama Rod is writing a lot about this. He's got another book coming out soon. One of my co-authors. Um, but uh, the fact that we were all black and writing about our experiences in Buddhism was kind of the first level of observation and analysis and collectivity building um, for radical dharma. The last thing we wrote about was the fact that we we're all queer. And it was almost as if it was so integrated already <laughs> that we've forgotten to name it. And it was so good that we did because it became really clear that part of the way that we all were able to kind of remain fugitive within the container of Buddhism was because of our queerness, because we'd already learned how to inhabit spaces of binary conformity and constraint in unconventional ways and otherwise ways to bring in Ashan Crawley's work. And so by existing in Buddhism otherwise, through our queerness, uh, we were actually able to find roots, relationships that were able to make it possible for us to stay. In some cases, uh, staying with like completely breaking with the tradition, with the lineage, um, in order to make a new space, which is what Raven, Reverend Angel did. I found Reverend Angel, <laughs> right? So uh, I was like, yeah, not this place, not that place, not this. Oh, okay. There's this woman who's black, who's queer from New York and is doing this. Let's let's find out what this is about. And it took me a long time to actually sit down there because I, you know, once you actually find the community, now you actually have to show up for yourself and that might be its own barrier, but at least there was no structural one anyway, anymore. Um, so I think the the relationship to our own, having to make our own way, kind of against the conventions of our upbringings. No one's really raised to be gay. No one's really raised to be queer. Um, Meant that we were resourced in that way to kind of make it work for us. And I also think there's something really kind of hard to name about an identity that's structured around sexual liberation. And I know that for myself, you know, it's just not appropriate (laughs) for me as a preacher's daughter, for me as a respectable, educated black person to be centering my own pleasure and to be putting that in kind of the foreground of the organization of my self. And it has been really challenging (laughs) to live into that truth. And without my practice, I don't think I would have been able to do it at all. Like, I think uh, because I found Buddhism around the same time that I was figuring out my sexuality, there was at least a possibility for me to, like, go out and get that thing that I needed (laughs) because it's part of my freedom. It's part of what makes me whole is being able to be unapologetic about what sexual liberation looks like for me and what kind of world, what kind of family, what kind of home I need in order for that to be a possibility. And I don't think that that's something that is surely, you know, taught directly through Buddhism, but an embrace of your whole self with no exceptions certainly is because you can't um, decenter an ego that's already been demolished. And so part of this process, part of this practice for me has been, you know, reclaiming like body retrieval, reclaiming my whole self, living truly into that truth, living fully into that truth so that I can then decenter it. Because if it's, you know, if you try to decenter the ego before you're whole, you will be quickly surprised by what repressed aspects of yourself come back. <laughs> Whoop you with the ass. 
<laughs> so, it, like, just for anyone, I think, you know, sexual integrity is really, really important to being a whole free person. <laughs> Not just for queers, but I think it's a particularly challenging quandary for, for folks who embody a queer, queer body. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. My next question is, you all bring up the need for conversations and collective action. And that's a that's a big thing in a U.S. culture that's very individual. And with with capitalism, you know, it dispossesses and it engulfs movements like it's taken over punk, it's taken hip hop, all types of things. But um, in the area of Buddhism and New Ageism, this uh, I feel New Ageism has grafted a dogma of Buddhism onto it that uses this neoliberal framing of individual game, game with things like The Secret or Visualizing Your Dream Home. Uh Jesse Maceo Vega Frey, he had called this the genetically modified dharma. (laughs) (laughs) That article is great. And the Buddha, Buddha Wazi. Uh, Can can you talk about the importance of collective action and Buddhism towards social justice rather than being co-opted by Silicon Valley where they do mindfulness (laughs) before stock trading or something like that. <laughs> That's great. Make, make mindfulness is the other one um, yeah. that I've heard. You know, it's really important that we honor ourselves and each other in all of the ways that we are individuated and in all the ways that we are different. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we all need to be acting as individuals or on our own behalf, every person for themselves. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And the kind of fetishization attached to individuation that comes with consumerism, that comes with an exchange economy, that comes with the commodification of time and people and turning people into property and using that as the kind of buttress upon which the hegemony of the country is lifted Mm -hmm. up. Um, I, I think we can, we do weird things. Um, So in American Buddhism, one of the things that I see oftentimes is that folks who even have a practice and have like, you know, deep practice can skip over the differences that, make us all a beautiful mosaic Mm -hmm. and default to oneness. So you either have this like mass commercialization of Buddhist philosophy and practice like you were talking about, or you have a complete flattening out of all of our historical embodied politically inherited differences, Mm -hmm. cultural into one fabric of, like, one mass fabric of oneness. So why can't we all just get along? Because we're all one. And both of those things um, are harmful. And both of those things are products of um, the air we breathe, uh, the capitalist ideology that says that we have to um, be useful in order to belong. Yeah, you're right about hegemony. It just it plays in so much. And digging deeper into the Sangha, and which I see as a type of beloved community, mm-hmm. um, this is something that I study a lot of autonomous movements and anarchist movements. Mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. something I've similarly seen in Rojava or Chiapas with the Zapatistas. And this is with communities working outside institutions and working outside of the state and learning to be in relationships with each other and to be with uh-huh. each other. Uh-huh. And they're seeking to unlearn neoliberalism and competitive capitalism that's invested our social reality. Uh-huh. And one thing I really like is your analogy of the train station. That oh, is, thanks. Instead of turning to each other, or instead of waiting for the train, we turn to each other. Uh-huh. And I was wondering, where do you see collective liberation taking place right now? Or what are you excited about where it's going? Or where would you like it to go? I'm really excited about Black Lives Matter. I'm really excited about the leaderful movement organization that's chapter-based, 
that's local but networked. I look I like that as a model um, because I think some of the most uh, kind of salient practices that I know about uh, were modeled during slavery through underground networks of escape and inhabitation that made it possible for people to live otherwise, even under slavery. And in this moment, it seems like that kind of marinage is still happening and still possible. It's not that it's going to happen, you know, without anyone knowing about it, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the kind of challenges of this particular moment is that it's really hard to do anything without any everyone knowing about it. <laughs> um, but I think there's also some va- virtue and value in that, in that uh, we can have covert action happening in plain sight. People think they know what Black Lives Matter is doing. And if you're not actually on the ground with the different chapters, it's actually kind of hard to know what they are doing. So it's as if they're operating in plain sight, but still doing really uh, covert work. And I think that is some of the most important strategy that we have available to us is to be organizing in plain sight and in ways that maybe aren't legible, Mm -hmm. readily legible to everyone, but that we're creating a different protocol of meaning making within our spaces that is creating possibility for change, protection. Yeah, and these, throughout the years, revolutionary movements have always sought internationalism, like with Black Lives Matter working with Palestine and Palestine showing solidarity with them. That's and right. also not just resisting, but building what you would like to see. Instead of waiting for what you don't like to see to crumble, you, you build it inside of inside of the poison. That's it. And, you know, what you run into when you do that is yourself, (laughs) right? Um, We're running into ourselves a lot in this work. And I think being able to figure out ways through conflict, ways to hold conflict, ways to storm without dissolving is, is probably the most important thing that we can work up right now. We rely on people to intervene on our behalf on behalf of the right <laughs> in all kinds of ways that are that fall short of calling the police. And particularly in our activist cultures, becoming more aware of the way we embody police culture, carceral culture, and disrupting it is going to be one of the most important strategies that we have at our disposal. And in your last chapter, uh, you, in what the world needs, you really break this open when you speak about mass incarceration. Uh, you say that according to the U.S., freedom is a prison. This is based on the 13th Amendment, where it says slavery is abolished, except, except as the, the huge word in this under punishment, which put it into the prison system, as you point out. And I feel that this goes full circle back to Harriet Jacobs. Mm-hmm. When, and you speak about that you want, we don't need more freedoms, we need more fugitives. We needed fugitives to find the loopholes in our language of liberation. We need fugitives now to keep abolishing the legacies of slavery, colonialism, and genocide that persist in the present day. And when I read this, it it was so visceral to me because you're directly calling to, like these aren't theories, that we have people in bondage right now. That's right. In Pelican Bay, in Rikers Island, and Real on lives are being destroyed. Yeah, we have children in cages on the border, and people are dying. And this trauma is going to transition to different generations. And and I just you're such a great writer, and it's very visceral the way you wrote this. Uh, can you speak about this more? Or break this passage open. Sure. Thank you for that. In the same way that I really resonate with the language, the litany of negation that makes up the Heart Sutra. They say, you know, no dharma is inherently, all dharmas are inherently empty. I think it's really important to not drink the Kool-Aid of our own 
strategies for liberation, our own ideologies of liberation, and be willing to jump ship and become fugitive when they no longer serve us. So one of the challenges of social movement organizing in the past is that they become so focused on a charismatic leader, are so focused on a singular issue or identity, that when the movement needs to become more uh, dynamic or inclusive or multifaceted, it has a really hard time evolving in that way because it's gotten so attached to that charismatic person, that issue or that identity. And what then happens is that we end up fighting each other instead of fighting the system that we're both being oppressed by. And so Stay Fugitive, particularly in that context, was uh, really a call to divest from the kind of nation-building projects of our social movements so that we can notice when it's time to turn around on the platform and join forces rather than continuing to double down and dig into our own individual um, wounding in order to get the kind of repair, relief, and healing that we need, uh, because that will indefinitely, that will certainly result in our destroying each other rather than destroying the system that we set out to resist. Thank you for that. That was perfectly said. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Time Talks podcast. Thanks again to Yasmin Saidullah for speaking to me. Please support her work and buy their book, Radical Dharma, linked in the show notes. Thanks to Awareness for the music as always. And please rate and share the show and check out the other amazing podcasts on the Channel Zero Network website.